America is home to 33 million small businesses, the beating heart of communities across the country. And proof that the American dream is still alive. This is a show about those dreamers and doers and the communities they serve. Their real life stories. Their struggles and successes. Their grit, determination, and passion. And the people who fight to keep their American dream alive. I'm Alfredo Ortiz. I'm Elaine Parker. And it's time for another episode of Main Street Matters. America's small business megaphone. Welcome to another episode of Main Street Matters, America's small business megaphone. I'm Alfredo Ortiz, Chief Executive Officer of Job Creators Network. Please subscribe to the show at salempodcastnetwork.com or wherever you get your podcast. Today, I'm very excited uh, to announce that we're joined by Dr. Ralph Alvarado. He joined uh, Tennessee Governor Bill Lee's cabinet in January of 2023 as the 15th commissioner of the Tennessee Department of Health. Dr. Alvarado has spent nearly a decade in public service and in 2014 was the first Hispanic member elected to the Kentucky General Assembly. During his service in the Kentucky Senate, Dr. Alvarado was chairman of the Senate Health and Welfare Committee, led the Substance Abuse Recovery Task Force, and was a member of the Medicaid Oversight Banking and Insurance and State and Local Government Committees. Ooh, that is a mouthful. <laughs> um, in mid-March, Job Creators Network announced that Dr. Ralph Alvarado will join the Board of Directors of Job Creators Network. Ralph, welcome to Main Street Matters, America's Small Business Megaphone. Thanks, Fred. I appreciate it. It's good to be here. Thank you very much. I was very excited to be able to get you on on uh, on our show. Had uh, such an incredible conversation with you last time I saw you, and I am just thrilled that you've decided to uh, uh, accept the offer to join our board. As you can imagine, you know, in uh, this particular year and going forward, I think this is year is the anniversary of uh, Obamacare, the tenth uh, or eleventh anniversary, I think. And uh, but boy, I don't think things are going any better than they were uh, back then. In fact, I think they're worse. So we're going to talk about that. But having you join our board and be able to provide that kind of leadership and direction and and insight is going to be so critical. So again, thank you for doing that, and thank you for all the service to our country so far, the different states that you've been at. Um, and before we get into all of that, though, I always love talking to folks about just kind of their background, kind of how did they get to this point because. I think sometimes it's fascinating uh, the journey that we take to get to where we are today. And uh, I'd love for you to just kind of walk uh, our listeners and viewers through that journey. And, uh, and then we'll uh, start talking about uh, healthcare. Sure. So it kind of a wild journey. Um, you know, my, uh, my wife and I are going to be celebrating 30 years of marriage this year. And uh, when I proposed to her, I remember asking her, she gave me a quick yes. And I remember telling her, are you sure, you know, the life of a doctor is often a tough one. People think it's this big, glamorous lifestyle. And it's, uh, it can be a tough, a tough job. You're almost a slave to your profession uh, and really uh, a lot of selfless time, but really never thought we'd be entering any kind of a political journey at all. I mean, I, I, I was a, uh, I'm a son of immigrants. My parents were from Argentina and Costa Rica. And uh, my dad uh, loved this country, uh, always instilled a pride of being American to my brother and I who were born in the States. And uh, the importance of voting. And uh, I grew up kind of in, a, in, the, in the Reagan generation, if you will, in the 1980s. And, and Ronald Reagan was uh, really, for me, a political idol uh, for him, just the way he approached things and, and kind of reinstituted American pride in people in a time when things were going rough. And so um, voted, was always kind of vocal about my opinions, but never really was involved in campaigns or anything. I wound up meeting my wife, got married. I went to college med school in the same place in southeastern California, went to the University of Kentucky for residency. And then once we got there, I tell people we got uh, kind of Kentuckyfied and decided yes, to stick ma'am. around and start a practice and kind of keep our family there. Um, you realize quickly as a young doctor when you're done and did primary care. So we kind of opened up our own shop and ran our own small business, if you will, and, and grew that into eventually three doctors and four nurse practitioners. But you realize quickly how much of an impact that government has on the practice of medicine. And um, I was always part of organized medicine. The medical association said, hey, your state legislators a swing vote on a particular issue. Uh, we'd like you to reach out to him and contact him. And so I did. And um, in the end, uh, the guy heard me out, but he didn't cast a vote. He purposely skipped a vote. He was nervous about it. And that almost made me angrier than if he had just said, I heard both sides and picked one side or the other, but um, told my wife I was upset. I said, look, I got to stop being upset. I got to get more involved. 
and went to the office one day. Someone came by knocking on our door campaigning for someone running for governor. My wife said, sure, put your sign up there. By the way, my husband wants to get more involved. That was a local party chairman who then reached out and said, hey, how about running for office? And they started us on a, on a journey that uh, I never thought I would be taking in, in my life, but basically ran for state house in 2004, 2006. Uh, got beat, uh, close loss in 04, got crushed in 2006 and thought we were done. Uh, 2010, the party called me up about running for state Senate. I said, look, uh, I've run twice. Uh, Alvarado is not your typical central Kentucky name. I don't know that I can get elected. Uh, we prayed about it, my wife and I, and, and um, kind of got a message when we didn't expect it to go ahead and run again. And so we did and lost in that race. We, we won two of the six counties, our home county, but they said, hey, we're, we're, you know, we're kind of redistricting. Why don't you run again in, in 2014? And so my, I promised my wife it would be my last time to get the whole thing out of my system. But we ran in 2014 and got in. And then once we got in, it was kind of 10 years of pent up policy of things that was trying to get accomplished and filed a lot of bills, had a lot of success in getting bills done uh, and eventually found myself as chairman of Senate Health and Welfare. And, and during that journey, uh, Senator Rand Paul was running for president. He asked me to kind of uh, uh, come out and kind of help in his announcement, which I did. Uh, he then dropped out and then everybody was kind of scrambling. Uh, remember having, I was a delegate for the, to the national convention in 2012, 2016, 2020. And uh, since I was going, uh, there was some comments being made on, on uh, TV about what mattered to Latino voters. And I didn't think it was entirely accurate. And so I uh, submitted a kind of an email to somebody that I knew that was pretty tight with RNC. That got in front of some folks who eventually, uh, through a long story, led to an opportunity to speak at the National Convention in 2016. And so got to speak there, deliver a speech, uh, both in English and Spanish, which was kind of cool and really encouraging people to vote for President Trump. Then Governor Bevin asked me to run with him for his lieutenant governor running mate in 2019. We ran, uh, good run, but we lost narrowly in that race, kind of famously so in Kentucky. And But I met Governor Bill Lee during that campaign. And then... Uh, here this about a year and a half ago, he uh, he had a, a vacancy and opening for uh, his role here for uh, kind of commissioner of health and said, how about joining my cabinet and coming in, coming to Tennessee? A long story there, too, but um, talked to a good friend who ultimately said, hey, uh, you know, do you want to be more of a doctor or more of a politician? And I said, well, I'm kind of both. He goes, yeah, but you got to pick one or the other. And I said, well, the political stuff is for a short while. I'm a doctor for life. And he said, look, you have an opportunity to impact the lives of so many more folks. And if you do a good job, you'll have a regional impact really in the southeastern part of the state. And so we've come uh, to Tennessee with a governor and a legislature who's politically aligned with me and um, really an opportunity to advance a lot of good health measures and trying to improve the health of people in Tennessee as well. So been at this now about uh, 14, 15 months, got a great staff, a great department, a lot of work to be done, uh, but really excited about the opportunity. So it's, it's been wonderful being here in Nashville and now being part of Tennessee. Well, that's great. I mean, I, I, I love the the journey that you've taken. Now, now you're an actual uh, practicing physician as well then, right? Yeah, that was part of the gig uh, was when I, you know, the governor, when he, I came and interviewed with him, he said, uh, you know, why do you want this role? I said, I don't know that I do. You you asked me I'm, and I'm here, but I'll be taking a pay cut too. And I said, so can I still do some clinical medicine? That's still kind of how I'm, and he, he encouraged me to do that. He said, we, we would like you to, it keeps you grounded. And so, yeah, one weekend a month, I, um, I'm allowed one day a month. So I add that to a weekend and one weekend a month, I go back to Kentucky. I have nursing home patients that I've seen for a long That's time great. that I, I go up and, and round on them and see them and follow them there and um, still submit. You know, I'll, tonight I'll be spending some evenings kind of still doing medical notes from those visits. So I submit those for billing and, and still practice medicine. So um, I enjoy it. I, I don't think I can ever get that out of my system. I just like it too much. Yeah, no, that's great. You know, so, so that's why I love, you know, your perspective on this, especially, you know, the, the, the current state of affairs when it comes to our healthcare system. You have such an insight from like before Obamacare and to where it is today. Kind of, can you t talk to us a little bit about like what it was like and what it's like today? And, you know, maybe the, 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 the good, the bad and the ugly of that? Yeah. I mean, practicing medicine, I guess just, um, several years ago, I mean, I, you know, I, I remember doctors when I was, when they were older, when I first started practicing, talked about how things had really changed from when they were first practicing medicine. People often refer to the golden age of medicine it was kind of in the seventies and eighties, really. Um, it, it's gotten more difficult. I mean, you take a look, um, you know, just saw some statistics probably about a month ago about what the expenditures were for the healthcare system in 1980 and what our outcomes were like in terms of life expectancy. Uh, and then you compare them to today where the costs have almost doubled, but yet our outcomes are about the same. Uh, they really haven't improved much. 
And so you start to question yourself, what were we doing back in, in 1980 to today, where it was half the cost with the same outcomes? Uh, and you really had a lot less uh, intrusion of government, a lot less intrusion of insurance companies, a lot of requirements. I remember back when I would write a medical note and that note was my note to remind me of what to do for my patient the next time I saw them. That note doesn't belong to the doctor anymore. That note now is an obligation for attorneys, for insurance companies, for the government. Uh, you've got to do certain things, put certain things in that note. It used to just be a reminder for the doctor about what to do at that next visit as they manage that person's care. And so you found yourself, you know, um, you know, we had a time, I think even when, when President Bush recommended back in 2002 or so to start going to electronic medical records. And so I responded at that time, went to an EMR system. Again, that's become so onerous now to the point where uh, physicians spend more time looking at computer screens. If you go in to see your doctor, um, the doctor is looking at a computer screen, uh, turns around, does a quick exam and inputs it. Whatever's in that chart is what matters. It isn't so much what's happening to you. And so there's that's really impacted uh, the patient physician relationship. So many rules from insurance, rules from government uh, and doctors and patients aren't calling their shots. Other people are calling their shots for them. Uh, and I think there's a lot of opportunities and unique ways in which we can kind of, again, bring that control back to doctors and to patients, letting them decide what's best for them and those outcomes. Uh, rather than having it be something that's government run or insurance company run. And, and that's the biggest difference I think we've seen in the last 40, 45 years really is how much of that power has been taken away from providers and has been placed in the hands of, of government entities and insurance entities. Well, and, and a shocking statistic that I've seen is the percentage of doctors that are actually no longer uh, uh, um, sole practitioners or on their own practice, basically they're part of a giant system it's if, if so if I remember the number, it's like 60, 65 percent now of doctors are basically part of a big system. Is that correct? As high as 70. Yeah. I mean, 70 wow. percent. So, you know, it used to be um, insurance companies, you know, they had to go to uh, individual providers and negotiate with each of them individually for contracts. Now that they've kind of forced a lot of providers into hospital systems and the larger employers, uh, they've got a lot less uh, people to have to go and they can do one giant contract negotiation and have to bother with a lot of smaller doctors. And so, yeah, I think if I if I want to as a health commissioner to get, you know, right now I'm focusing on trying to get uh, enhanced lung cancer screenings, colorectal screenings Our you know, our rates need to be better uh, in Tennessee. And so one of the first people I went to talk to was really the head of the Tennessee Hospital Association. Uh, why? Because they employ most of the doctors. And so they control the electronic medical records where those reminders come in for providers to do that, to try to encourage that. So you'll often go talk to them because they're the ones who can uh, get a hold of the doctor instead of going to each individual practice and reminding physicians what to do. So 70 percent, I'd say, are probably employed. Um, we've seen that, you know, from primary care. Most doctors coming out of, of residency right now, if they're primary care, uh, are not even considering opening up and hanging up their own shingle. They're going into larger group practices and settings uh, where they can, you know, their schedule is different. Um, their obligations are different. Their call is different than it used to be. So physicians in the old days would take their own call, do their own hospital work. The system's gotten so difficult that uh, you can't keep up with all the requirements to be able to maintain those privileges. So a lot of docs have given up that, that hospital work. So the work gets very siloed where people that you might see a doctor in a clinic and they know your case there, but if you get sick enough to be put into a hospital, they're not following you there. A doctor who doesn't know you is seeing you and then trying to communicate that back. And it's it's become very disjointed. Um, and it's, I think it's led to the detriment of, of outcomes for people as well. Now, uh, Dr. Alvarado, I know uh, when we sat down and we chatted a little bit, uh, I mentioned a program that we had developed the Job Creators Network a couple years back called healthcareforyou.com. Uh, basically that was our answer to Bernie care, uh, you know, basically, which was Medicare for all. Um, and I know, I think you, you went, you went through, uh, that information. Um, talk to me about your philosophy or your thoughts on, you know, first of all, uh, you know, our program that talked a little bit more about the doctor involvement. Um, but your thoughts, I know, cause you, you've had a lot of insight on this as well, but what that, what the fix is for what we currently have, because it's so, uh, like, onerous right right now i mean it's just almost an out of control system that to your point isn't really improving people's health it's just costing twice as much um so so, so what is the fix and you know like i said what's your kind of reaction or healthcareforyou.com yeah. um, insights 
Yeah, I, so I, I like I like the model. I mean, obviously, a lot of what we're seeing is again, it's just the, the control of the power is in is is in the wrong hands. Is what it comes down to. It's got to get back to doctors and and patients at some point along the way. Uh, and I often talk about the problem within the system is that there's just less trust of of providers. Uh, we're in the United States. There's it's very heavy on. Um, you know, a defensive medicine type of practice. I mean, doctors are worried about getting sued all the time uh, because, you know, they don't trust their own judgment, I think, a lot of times. And we as a society have not trusted our doctor's judgment anymore. I had a very good friend who went to New Zealand uh, years ago to do a locum tenens, which is kind of a, you know, a six months contract to go fill in for someone. And, and so he went to do that. Um, and the second person that he saw had a litany of complaints and uh, the American doctor said, well, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and order this test, this, all these tests. And, the, and the, the New Zealanders said, wait, 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 hold on. I know you're a Yankee, he says, but we don't sue our doctors here, was his comment. And he said, you know, you're trained, right? You, you, got, you're, you got a license. Yeah, I'm licensed. I'm board certified. Great. Based on what I've told you in your exam of me, what do you think I have? Well, yeah. you, pro you probably have this. Well, can't we go with that? You just treat that. And then if, if that isn't work, then you can do all your tests. And the doctor went, yeah, okay. And, and sure enough, that's what he had. And the guy got better. And that kind of an encounter just doesn't exist in America much anymore. I mean, basically, if you're going to do it, you probably have this, but I got to double check with lab tests and all these things to make sure that I'm not wrong. Because if I am, somebody might come after me. And that's kind of the, the, become the American mentality and how we approach care is trying to, uh, you know, not rely on our own judgment or providers are trying to rely on their own judgment. So that's a lot of it is the trust factor. I think we probably spend more time policing doctors uh, than letting them just do the work that they need to do. And I think there's better ways of delivering how we deliver, um, you know, uh, medications, uh, lots of different concepts on how that can be done. Right. Uh, I've always thought Medicare Advantage leaves people a donut hole at the end of the year where doctors have to sit down with their patients and refigure their entire medication regimen to fit within a budget. Why not just do that from the beginning and just give patients and the, and, and the doctor kind of a budget to say, here's how much we're willing to cover within a certain diagnosis and let them figure that out themselves instead of having backroom negotiations and deals between insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies to determine what drugs I can use. Let me pick the drugs. Give me the budget. I can figure it out with my patient and make that happen. So lo lots of places where we can work, but it's going to have to be a trust of our providers again, a trust of letting the doctors kind of run the show instead of an immediate distrust that someone's trying to rob somebody. I, I know there's fraud and there's waste that goes on within uh, Medicare. I get that. We have to police that and, and punish those who do that because it ruins it for the entire system. But when that, you know, when the, when the, the, the tail is wagging the dog, th that kind of ruins the entire system for everybody else. And so there's better ways of doing this. And I see, we see a lot of doctors, just shunning insurance companies saying, we're done. No more of this. We want to go back to old fashioned, have a patient just pay me and I'll, I'll be at your back. I'm not going to deal with the insurance company and I'll do what's in your best interest uh, to begin with. Yeah. To, to that point, I guess there's uh, um, a group of doctors or a system moving away. I call this kind of DPC doctors, direct primary care. Correct. Yeah. Um, uh, can you talk to us a little bit about that? Cause I know that there's been a real movement towards that. A lot of my friends are actually just left the insurance systems what together, and I've gone to this DPC system. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Sure, yeah. So direct direct primary care is one of the bills I kind of advanced when I was a legislator in Kentucky. There was a lot of a lot of pushback from insurance companies who wanted us to say that that was some form of insurance, and it's not. Uh, it's basically a direct primary care uh, model, which is where a prov you pay a provider. It's almost like a blue collar concierge. Uh, you know, people hear of concierge medicine, people that are wealthy will often give a doctor a fee of like $2,000 a year. That doctor is then at your beck and call. Uh, you have a cell phone. Whenever he calls you, he can do a telehealth visit. Uh, he can come and see you at your home, at your place of business, wherever to do an examination, can prescribe you necessary treatments, order necessary lab tests. But he's not going to deal with insurance companies. He's not going to do any of those things. Uh, and, it, you know, he'll order the test. You can get them done. And then if the patient wants reimbursement from an insurance company, they can then fill up the paperwork to get that done because the doctor is just done with it. Now, that doctor typically um, often will just have a cell phone. It doesn't have to have a full staff, uh, is mobile, can come to you, do house calls. Uh, and those doctors are making less money. Uh, a lot of them are. I mean, some of them that are doing the DPC model might be getting a monthly fee. They might charge a family fee for the whole family or charge the, you know, the patient an individual amount of money per month to do all that work and to do your exams and to have recommendations and do all those sorts of things. Um, the doctors are often making less than they would make, but they're enjoying their jobs again and they have a smile on their face again. 
And uh, frankly, a lot of them are just finding that the stress of insurance companies, all of the overhead, all of that headache is gone. And if the patient wants to deal with it, that they can fill that paperwork out and get it. But otherwise, they're going to provide you physician services at the hospital, in a nursing home, in your office, wherever it has to be done. Uh, and they can provide a lot of those services for you. So it just takes insurance companies out of the way. Uh, and we're starting to see a lot of patients, frankly, like that. There's even some states where hospitals are being set up in a similar model where uh, doctors uh, have set up a hospital and they can say, OK, you walk in and there's a price sheet. Uh, this is how much it costs to take out your gallbladder. This is how much these medications are going to cost. And they're the accurate cost instead of some overcharged amount that you don't know how much you're paying. You know exactly how much you're paying. You can write a check and get it all covered and paid for, and they'll take care of all those services. So we're starting to see doctors shun, uh, kind of disrupt and shun the current system and just take matters into their own hands and start charging people so that they know exactly what they're getting when they pay for something, what, what services they're getting from that right. provider. So, so, so it's, it's curious from um, now that's a state by state kind of model, right? I mean, each state needs to determine whether or not they allow DPC model. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, yeah. So DPC models, I think they can be done in most states. The problem is you're, you're having what, what's occurred is some of the insurance companies are trying to block that claiming okay. it's, well, you're providing some kind of insurance. You're not really providing a global insurance. You might be providing a monthly fee or an annual fee for that physician's services. Um, but it isn't insurance. It doesn't cover all the things that insurance would cover normally. So um, there's been some arguments. So you've had to pass laws in states to clarify exactly what that is, that it's not a form of insurance, that this is allowed as a, as a practice of medicine. And so several states have, have taken it upon themselves to clarify that uh, and, and to put that out there. So that's been what, what, they've, what they've been trying to do is more or less clarify to secure it so you can protect that business model. Now I can't imagine that the um, that the developers or the thought the guys who came up with Obamacare would would find this model very appealing to them because it seems to be competing with Obamacare, right? I mean, the, the it seems like the whole model of Obamacare is you can cover everybody basically, but kind of on a minimal services across the board, you kind of equivalize it across everybody. Um, th but that model doesn't seem as effective to me as something like this DPC model. So talk to me about how that, that model DPC works around uh, Obamacare, I guess. Yeah, so it, so you couldn't, uh, I don't think you're allowed, um, if you're a Medicaid recipient of any type, which is what Obamacare often is, that you cannot use a direct primary care provider in a lot of states, so they won't allow that. So in other words, you would have to, uh, it, they would view that as, as if you're able to pay for your own care um, to a DPC person, uh, that person would have to be a Medicaid provider to have their orders recognized. So what would happen typically, let's say if you're getting uh, Obamacare, the ACA of any type, and you've got expanded Medicaid, um, if you're getting Medicaid, you've got to go to a Medicaid provider to have those orders recognized. So, for example, um, I could see somebody for free. Let's say I wanted to do a charity case and see somebody for free, but they've got Obamacare and I want to write them an antibiotic or order them a chest X-ray and I'm not contracted with Medicaid. Uh, Medicaid will not recognize me as a legitimate provider, even though I have a license to practice medicine and I'm board certified. And I'm, I'm a qualified doctor. They'll say, well, you're not contracted with us. So we don't recognize that provider. We won't honor that prescription. We won't honor uh, the lab test. We won't honor the X-rays if you want Medicaid to pay for it. Uh, you'd have to have now some states have changed that. I think the state of Virginia, for example, has a category where you can have a provider be an ordering, referring or prescribing doctor for Medicaid. They call them ORP docs and they can be registered with Medicaid, not contracted. So it would allow a provider to do that. But most states don't have that type of uh, allowance. I tried to push that in Kentucky and got a lot of resistance and, and couldn't get it through. But it would allow providers to be able to do that. But that's a state by state basis. Um, but typically, most of the Medicaid, they want to have control over that, right? They don't want to have an outside provider saying, well, I think this person needs an antibiotic or a medicine because the insurance company has control over that and they have a vested interest not to relinquish that to some doctor who they don't know. Um, so you could create a system where you could have them registered to make sure that they're legitimate, they're licensed, they don't have, they're not a bad doctor, have a bunch of malpractice suits against them, that they're kind of a good provider. Uh, and they're not going to charge Medicaid. Medicaid, if anything, would benefit from someone seeing them effectively for free because they're not having to pay and can take care of their patient. But it comes down to control. That The resistance comes from those insurance companies who don't want to relinquish that to a provider that they don't know 
They want to be able to say, if you're contracted with me, you have to prescribe these medicines or do things in a certain way if you want to maintain your contract. And so that's where, um, again, a lot of that is just what, what I find myself, what we're doing is we're slowly inching our way more towards a socialized healthcare model. Uh, every time that we do these expansions and getting closer and closer to that. Some people like that concept. Um, I think we've got lots of examples where that creates a two-tiered level of care. The wealthy who can pay for their own care and those, the rest of us who can't. Uh, or if you, can, if you can't afford that, the delays and the, the time it takes to get a lot of that care becomes longer and longer. And we're starting to see that uh, some in the American model now, too. You know, I mean, it's it, I, I dabbled a little bit in my consulting days on this whole healthcare stuff, and it just seems to be getting more and more complicated. Um, Obamacare, in my opinion, didn't do much to actually address the cost of healthcare, just access to healthcare, which to me, if you can't afford the access, who cares, right? I mean, if I can, you know, if I have access to a Rolls Royce, but I can't pay for it, like, okay, I mean, you know, what good does that do me? I mean, what, what, what can we do? I mean, first of all, yeah, I think, you know, we've heard the tort reform, uh, which is basically preventing or minimizing lawsuits. For example, for example, you talk about defensive medicine as one of the ways that doctors are really trying to avoid these lawsuits. But, but, but what is your perspective on this tort reform in this country? And why haven't we done more with it? There's a lot of lawyers. That's why. <laughs> Probably more lawyers than there are doctors in the system. It's like 30% of healthcare costs, right? 95% of the world's lawyers live in the United States. 95% of the world's lawyers. So that gives you an idea. Um, you can watch uh, a lot of advertisements every day on television and see how much advertising there is when certain demographics are watching TV because they, they're trying to drum up business for that. That's a lot of the problem. Um, you know, it, it's one thing... You know, I understand if a doctor does something, you know, there's plenty of cases where someone has really badly screwed up and been negligent and done something bad. And I, no one can argue that, that that isn't the right thing. That that person probably needs to, you know, reimburse that person for something that they've done wrong. Um, it, but a lot of what you're getting is a lot of pain and suffering claims where you can sue someone for their economic damages. I, I don't, I would never dream of restricting someone's economic damages. It's the non-economic damages. It's the, the pain and suffering punitive damages where you get astronomical amounts granted to someone uh, and that that ruins the system. In, in Kentucky, I know, for example, uh, there was a recent lawsuit uh, for a complication from a surgery for a rather large medical group in the southern part. I think it's the largest private medical group in the southern part of the state. Someone had a surgery, their bowel got nicked during the surgery, it was a hernia repair. Not an uncommon side effect that could happen from that, but it led to a larger surgery, kind of a bowel resection. That person sued and got a 28 or over $20 million judgment for an un, not an uncommon complication from a surgery. It's unfortunate that it happened. But when you sign a form, you kind of acknowledge these are risks of the procedure. Yeah. And, um, that, and it bankrupted an entire medical group of 220 plus physicians. Um, you know, so what happens to that group now? Does it sustain itself? I mean, you might lose physicians that peel off from that. Um, it, it winds up hurting in that regard. And then it winds up just increasing costs for others. When you look at long-term care in nursing homes, um, there are certain states that don't have any any protections at all. So it's the wide open uh, in Kentucky is one of those states where there's no protections for providers. So you've got nursing homes there that are paying almost uh, you know a million dollars per year for their malpractice insurance policy and a half a million dollar deductible on top of that. Uh, to try to just, and those are the ones that are lucky enough to get insurance. Some can't even get that as well. So you're getting places where uh, no one wants to invest in new nursing home care or in long-term care because of the risks of that. And they're trying to get out. Once they buy something, they, they almost want to shut the building down because they can't afford, it's cheaper to shut it down than yeah. to keep it open and pay for those kinds of costs. There's states that have put in restrictions, caps on non-economic uh, damages, which are ways of approaching it. Some have done what's called an affidavit of merit that you can't file a suit unless you have another doctor or two other doctors sign off saying, yeah, we think this was a negligent case. Um, but there's lots of abuses still in the system where you're getting lawsuits that are not legitimate just because they can. And they know that the cost of fighting those cases in court are so expensive to defend yourself. It's just cheaper to give them a check than to go to uh, spend four times the money to defend yourself and win the case in court. And so part of it's also how our courts are designed, the amount of appeals and different things that people do to increase the cost of some of these cases uh, using that as a weapon, uh, it, it makes it really hard for providers to fight those fights, uh, and it gets really, really expensive. So that's a lot of the um, uh, the systems. And when you try to reform those, uh, frankly, they're the people often who are contributing uh, to some of these judges being in those positions and 
uh, it, it makes it really, really difficult. So we have to keep fighting that fight, I think, just to make it reasonable. Uh, other countries have different ideas of how they do that. But in the United States, it's um, it just it, doctors have found it easier just to train doctors to sp spend a lot of money on getting extra tests uh, just to protect yourself. Um, you know, somebody may have, for example, you have a person who you don't know who has come in repeatedly for the same diagnosis. They just had they were just in the hospital the week before. They had a CAT scan that didn't show anything, but they come in with similar symptoms, similar problems, and the CAT scan is repeated. Why? Well, because it may have changed in a week. It probably hasn't changed in a week, but you got to cover yourself. And so these people get exposed to repeated tests, repeated costs. It just drives the cost of healthcare up for all of us when that happens. And it exposes people often to unwanted, uh, you know, dyes and, and radiation and different things. Sure. And it just makes it more expensive and, and hard. So, so I know. I know you're you're very progressive in terms of different thinking of what we can do with our healthcare system, and and I do believe that this kind of tort reform is 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 an important part of bringing our costs down. Because you know, I have a, a lot of friends, and they tell me, you know, doctors just you, we're not making enough money anymore, right? I mean, to make it worth it. And I go, I don't think it's actually a a, a matter of making enough from a revenue standpoint. Is that you're paying too much in expenses, right? So your net isn't worth it, right? So if we bring down the net, kind of the, you know, uh, or excuse me, increase the net by bringing down the expenses, right? Maybe we can stop from the increasing and ballooning healthcare costs. Um, your, your, your thoughts, you're, your, you know, you're working under Governor Lee uh, in, in Tennessee. Um, he's a great governor, really some great thinking forward thinking stuff, a legislator that I think thinks your way, thinks conservative, um, you know, also, you know, kind of follows this path of, of conservative thinking. Do you think there's an opportunity to test kind of some kind of tort reform in your state, for example? Well, they have what's called an affidavit of merit here. So what they've got is if you're going to file a lawsuit against a doctor, you have to have another licensed physician in the state kind of sign a form saying, yes, okay. I think there's a case for negligence here. That has, I mean, I've talked to our provider, that, that really has helped the providers in Tennessee quite a bit. Uh, and it's been able to, so the cases that come forward are typically legitimate cases that probably should go before a jury and should be heard. So that's really assisted here. And, and some states have done that uh, to help in that regard. The one thing that I think is really unique for Tennessee that we've got is there's no Medicaid expansion in Tennessee, but what they do have is a block grant for Medicaid, which I think we're the only state that has that in the union. Uh, I'm, I've always been a big believer in federalism, right? The federal government has its role, but if you're going to give money back to the states, instead of tying all kinds of uh, political policy issues to funds that you're giving is just to say, hey, states, this is meant for this. You know, you can hear that very loose boundaries, go do good work. Every state's different. They can figure out how to use those funds for that purpose and do it well. The blo a block grant model is that here. And what they've created is effectively an accountable care organization for Medicaid for the entire state of Tennessee. They've gone to the Medicaid program and said, here's this money for Medicaid. You're going to use it. Here's what we think is what you were spending. Here's what we think you should be spending at. And if you can bring your costs down to that level, we will split whatever you save. We'll split with the federal government. Medicare does that for ACOs, for doctors and large physician groups and, and hospital systems. They've done that with the entire state of Tennessee. And Tennessee has gotten very good at finding savings and being very cost effective. And they're saving hundreds of millions of dollars that they're able to split with the federal government. And then they use those savings for innovative healthcare ideas. We're looking at funding uh, here in this upcoming budget, a healthcare resiliency program, which we're able to use grants for our health partners in the state, for providers, for uh, clinics, for hospital systems, to fund innovation in rural communities in particular, to help fund uh, residency positions, to have more doctors train in Tennessee, to try to encourage doctors and nurses to take on students and residents into their clinics so they can get an experience of what rural health care is like. So lots of really cool, innovative stuff that could be funded with those savings, but letting the state figure out how to run the system the best. And it's working very, very well. It's been remarkable. Uh, and it's a model that I think could be duplicated throughout the entire country. Again, you have to have the federal government be willing to give up control and just say, here's states, here's what you're spending. We think you can get here. You figure it out and we'll split the savings with you. Taxpayers would save money. The federal government would save money a lot less oversight and let the states figure it out, which are often uh, the laboratories of democracies, what we were once called, the states can do this stuff better. And I think if we just give our states the opportunity 
Uh, I've had an example with just some CDC grants with HIV funding. We got criticism for rejecting those and using state dollars. The, the amount of data we're getting right now and how much more testing, how much more efficient we were is incredible. I'm waiting for the full year of data because I'd like to put out a full report when that comes down to show what just using state dollars and the flexibility of a state dollar instead of a highly restricted federal dollar and how much more effective you can do in prevention is going to be remarkable. So we're looking forward to having some of that. But having that kind of a model when it comes to Medicaid, letting states figure it out and use it properly, I think we'd be much, much more efficient and, yeah. and we would, we'd know exactly what our state needs when it comes to those dollars as well. Well, when you get that data, I'd love for us to talk a little bit about putting out a uh, op-ed basically on this, getting that data out there, because Dr. Alvarado, that's one thing, you know, as Republicans, we have these great ideas, great innovative ideas that can really bring down healthcare costs, but we just suck at really talking about them and getting the public to understand what we're trying to do and what we're trying to say. And, you know, unfortunately, the left has really kind of you know, labeled as, as, you know, they're going to just want to take your Medicare away, take this away and take that away. Right. But why, why are we so bad at articulating these great, great experiments and thinking uh, in the healthcare space? Yeah. I mean, I, I'll give you an example for HIV grants, which was, um, you know, when I first got here, we is eight, two grants, $8.8 .8 million. Um, we weren't, um, we were at, at our peak, we used 7 million of the 8.8. .8. And why, why is that? Well, because it, it was going through a grantee and then through sub grantees. And so the sub grantee would have to spend their own money and then come back to the grantee and say, I spent the money. Uh, I have to prove that I didn't rob from you and then get reimbursed and then use that reimbursement to spend the money again. And that process was very, very slow. Some, yeah. of, our, some of our jurisdictions were only using a third of the eligible money for HIV prevention while we were watching our HIV rates climb and go up. And I'm saying, how come we're not doing better with this? So basically came to the legislature, came to the governor's office. They agreed and the legislature agreed to use state dollars to just reject those funds, use state funds. And they gave us nine million dollars and say here. And, and we've created a grant system that was very simple. We went to the to our partners who were doing a really good job and said, here's a three page grant. Here's what you need to use it for. Go do good work. And I told them all, you better use the money. If you don't, I'll be really upset. I'll give it to somebody else who's using it. And in the first two quarters, uh, I think what we did, I think, was 17,000 HIV tests with federal funds. We've done th over 37,000 HIV tests in the first two quarters. Prep kits that were going out, we were at 120% of our annual expected amounts in the first two quarters. So we're double as over double as efficient just using state dollars. What's the difference? The color of the money is the same. The source and the restrictions is what's different. And again, if we could just when I've gone to D.C. to talk to our legislators and our congressmen, our senators, they say, what can we be doing for you guys? I said, give us all the flexibility you can on, on funding. Let us do the work. We want to do good work. I trust us to do that. And so that's always the, the what we go advocate for, even with uh, kind of our national organizations like ASTO and those is just to let us do the work. The states will know how to spend it right. That's the fundamental core. That was what our, our country was founded on, was on that basis as the federal government has flexed. They want to say, well, we'll give you this money only if you do what we tell you to do and how we tell you to do it. And often that just makes it it almost defeats the purpose of the of the grants to begin with. I had one colleague who said he'd rather get a million dollars in unrestricted federal funds than a hundred million in restricted funds because he just finds it finds it easier and probably could do more good with that than with all the amount of money that has all kinds of strings attached. Well, as you know, 24 is an election year, and so I'm hoping that we can get this great information out there because there are all there are alternatives to Obamacare that I think you know you've you basically put, they're more effective they're more efficient um, and I think you know can really address this rising healthcare cost you know I know we're running out of time but really quickly um, in our conversation last that last time we we spoke we talked about association health plans as you know cost for small business owners on healthcare costs <clears throat> is just through the roof. They don't have the benefits of a large employer and, you know, maybe being self-insured and all this stuff. It's just astronomical for these small businesses. Um, Secretary Acosta actually was now on, like I mentioned, is on our board, came up with this idea of association health plans. It took, you know, as soon as he launched it, boom, he, he was sued to basically stop uh, the program. Such a shame. Talk to us a little bit about your, uh, your ideas or your thoughts about association health plans and why that was a good idea 
and what we should do moving forward with those. It, it was genius. I mean, and it makes complete sense. Um, I can't tell you when those rolled out. Uh, I, I think, you know, at the time, I think the, the president had said he was being told by folks in the industry, you can't do that. He goes, why not? Yeah, you're going to do it and go get it done. And and the administration and the cabinet got it done, which was remarkable. It allowed small businesses who might be, you know, under 10 employees, five employees. It's hard for them to compete and get something affordable when it comes to insurance. They want to provide that for their employees. This allowed them to group together with other small businesses. And I remember when those rolled out, the chambers of commerce were very excited because a lot of small local chambers would advertise their members saying, hey, look, if you want to, if you have two employees, right, you and one other person, you're working. You're two employees, you can qualify, everybody teamed up. They were able to get group rates and get big discounts in the cost of their health care. It was remarkable. Uh, and it, and it, it worked wonders for folks. And so, I mean, I think the more we can do that kind of stuff, I think it just helps small business owners be able to get some kind of protection and getting back to what um, those used to be like. I mean, again, the, the power of this has been taken away from people it, and it's been put in the, in the power of just a few and it's not, you know, if, if their interests were aligned with that of the average person, it would not be as big of a deal. But those interests are not aligned. And it's much different. Uh, and it makes it really, really difficult for, for any, any kind of a, a business owner today to find something affordable. Those were a genius idea. Chambers all over the country uh, put those to use and got people taken care of. And they were able to get affordable insurance for people and sometimes often big reductions in their costs to let them be able to do their business, which is what they want to do. So. Uh, those have got to come back. I mean, they just made too much sense. I don't know why those yeah. have been rested away, but yeah. get those back yeah. being active again. Well, what I'm really excited about having uh, Secretary Acosta on our board and you on our board is that, uh, and, and our idea of healthcareforyou.com, bringing these three things together, we can push for a better alternative. And that, quite frankly, I think help the country, help our party, quite frankly, have a better way of talking about healthcare because I'm sorry, but election after election, we just fumble this one. Yeah. And there's no reason because we have the creative and innovative ideas to bring down healthcare costs and to actually provide more effective and more efficient and quite frankly, just better, uh, I think, medical care to all of America versus what we currently have right now. And so, you know, so so I'm excited that, you know, between, uh, you know, Job Careers Network and yourself, like I said, and Secretary Acosta, we can put information out there and I hopefully educate the public that there is a better way. And I think you've got willing partners in certain states. So if you want to, again, again, a, a block grant model for Medicaid is a dream. Any legislator in state legislatures, it would be a dream to have that kind of control and power. In Tennessee, it's working. It's working wonders. We've got years now of showing savings and how those funds are being used for other purposes. That can be duplicated. Once you test it, every, every state is a, is a potential laboratory. Try them, let them do it. And if it works, then allow it to be duplicated. Right now, you apply for an 1115 waiver and you can say, well, you were the first one, you had good innovation and they let it sit there and we're not duplicating these throughout other states. I mean, if you can say it worked in Tennessee, let's carry this to other states. Who else wants to do this? You'll no. have several states raise their hand and say, we want to because they want control of it. That's what needs to start happening is once you find something that works, let it be duplicated and try it in all the states and see who else wants to do it. You'll probably find a lot of willing partners. Yeah, well, we're, well we're, we're fortunate because Governor Lee is the chair of the Republican, Republican Governors Association. And so, you know, hopefully he can bring together some of his colleagues and share some of the success that's going on in your state, some of your ideas, you know, again, bring it in Secretary Acosta and getting our governors, at least on the Republican state, started on something that may make sense and hopefully kind of push back on this idea of Obamacare. Because, again, just acts, having greater access doesn't mean you can afford the health care that that access provides you. And so I think we can do a lot better for our country and for all of America here and all of the hardworking Americans and small businesses. And so, again, I'm excited to do that. But, uh, Dr. Alvarado, I could talk to you for hours about this, and uh, I'm sure we're going to have another opportunity, but we've run out of time, and I want to be respectful of your time. I want to thank you. Uh, for joining us on Main Street Matters, America's Small Business Megaphone. And we want to thank everybody out there who's listening and watching uh, for your time. Uh, Main Street Matters is part of the Salem Podcast Network. Uh, new episodes to view every Wednesday and Friday. Please subscribe at SalemPodcastNetwork.com or wherever you get your podcast. And we'll be back soon with another episode. Goodbye for now. And again, thank you, Dr. Alvarado. 